I hope you had a good week. I'm currently preaching through 1 Peter, and I'm going to be in chapter 1 again. I hope you'll turn there with me. Usually I don't have uh, creative titles, but I got one today. <laughs> kind of jumped all over me. <laughs> I'm going to be looking at the paragraph beginning in verse 13 through 21. And I've entitled it, The Holy Ones, Holy Ones. <laughs> Isn't that clever? Ah. I guess, as I think back through how God has led me in proclamation, I do feel like that I am a great commission preacher, a gospel preacher. I, I do love evangelism. I do think that the Great Commission is priority for the Church of Jesus Christ and that we tend to lose focus if we don't let the main thing remain the main thing. But what bothers me is that I think we have preached a cheap gospel. And the gospel we have preached as evangelicals is only believe, only believe. Now, in trying to correct that, what I think is a half-truth. It almost seems like I'm denying the necessity of a decision, and I am not. I believe, as an evangelical, there must be a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And that personal encounter involves repentance and faith, but I want, I want to scream that that personal encounter must issue in daily Christ-likeness. And my fear is that we've confused an initial decision with a daily discipleship. And that we have settled for a past event, however powerful and emotional that past event may be a past event that often has no direct, intimate, relevant relationship with current decision-making and lifestyle choices. And I think that is a grave mistake in evangelicalism. What God wants is a godly people to reflect his character. I want to say that again. God wants the nations, i.e., those who do not know him, to know him by means of a changed and changing people, the people of God. Put it another way. The intimacy, the mutuality of Genesis 1 and 2 is terribly and radically damaged by the self-centered fall of Genesis 3. I believe that what Jesus does in knowing him personally is restore the damaged image and likeness of God that enables immediate, not heaven by and by, immediate, intimate, personal fellowship with the God of creation now. And that intimacy with the God of creation radically changes the person. Now, it is a process. Personality types are involved. Life situations are involved. Biblical knowledge is involved. But God is wanting to change us so that when people encounter us in the daily life that all of us live, they will see our good works and they will glorify our Father in heaven. The goal is Great Commission living, not just Great Commission proclamation, not just Great Commission decision-making, but Great Commission living. And what's missing in the evangelical gospel is a call to Great Commission living. And so the Holy One wants Holy Ones. Now, beginning in verse 13 through 17, whenever therefore starts a paragraph, you can just know it's important. 
And what it is basically saying, and you know this, you know English, what therefore in English is saying is based on what's gone before, here is what I want to say. Here are the consequences, here's the results, here's the whatever, purpose. So what has gone before? Remember, the Bible cannot be interpreted in isolated proof text. The Bible is true, but it's true in context, true in historical context. The only inspired person is the original author. It's true, true in literary context. We must follow the original author's thought at paragraph level through the entire book that they have written and not pull out little verses and words and phrases that we can twist or bend to an American Baptist theology. God deliver us from an American Baptist theology, amen? Because it turns into an American Baptist Jesus, and I want no part of an American Baptist Jesus, particularly a white Protestant one. I'm over it now. Follow with me back to verse 2. The triune God, the Trinity, is active in the salvation of lost people. Verses 3 through 5, the Trinity is active in protecting, garrisoning, um, guarding that salvation that he's brought. Then beginning in 9 and 10, this is not something new. This is not, the new covenant is not totally radically different from the old covenant. The prophets saw it. The prophets were looking for the exact time and the exact person that the new covenant would work out. They didn't completely and fully see it. But you have completely and fully seen it. It uh, scares me, I mean that very seriously, that I have more knowledge about God and his purposes and his plan and his Messiah than any Old Testament prophet. I know more about God this side of the cross than any of the great men and women of faith recorded in the Old Covenant. And the question screams, what are you doing with that kind of knowledge of the person and purpose of the Creator God? Based on who God is and what He has done, then in verse 13 we come. And you know my mind kind of runs like this. I was up in Kansas a few years ago at a church and somebody said, oh, oh, you're the, you're the guy that outlines things. <laughs> now, I never thought about that, but that's exactly what I am. I look for structures in the biblical text, patterns, ways of revealing the truth. And when I come to a text like this, I want to show you the six they're all imperatives or participles used as imperatives of God's will for the life of the Christian. There are six of them in verses 13 through 17 and a seventh one, Jewish thought, added in verse 21. These are God's commands, God's will, God's admonition, God's mandate, you pick a word, for his children. Six of them. Follow with me. I'll mark them off as I go through it. Therefore, number one, gird up the loins of your mind for action. This reminds me of the great prayer um, of the Jews from uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6, called the Shema, which says we worship the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, minds, and strengths. This is, this is get ready for mental action. This is get ready to think through it. This is get ready to uh, uh, give your mind as a sacrifice gift to God as long with other parts of your personality. Now, literally, this is gird up the loins of your mind. Sounds a whole lot like uh, Romans 12, too. I'm shocked how much Peter's terminology seems to be Pauline. I don't know who influenced who. I kind of think Paul influenced Peter, but anyway. Gird up the loins. I always get tickled when I go to some church and they say, now you know your wife can't wear pantsuits. Why? My wife have, what if my wife had ugly legs? Couldn't she wear pantsuits? No, she can't wear pantsuits here. Why not? Well, because the Old Testament says that uh, women can't wear men's clothes. I just want to absolutely slap somebody, in Jesus' name, of course. Everybody in the Old Testament wore robes. The only difference between men's robes and women's robes, women's had blue decoration on, on the shoulders. Nobody wore pants. There were no pants. So if somebody wanted 
to get ready to dig a ditch or work in the kitchen or work in the garden, they reached through their legs, grabbed the back of their robe, pulled it through their legs, and tucked it in their belt, which made trousers out of it. It's an idiom for get prepared for strenuous labor. Now, it's also metaphorical in that be prepared to think clearly. Uh, get away from the thoughts of the world. Get away from what you've always heard. Get away from your culture and your mama and your denomination. Get ready to think. Think what? Think God's thoughts. Think a biblical worldview. Think of what Peter is trying to say in context. So the first command for God's children is get ready to think. Think hard. The second one, and notice, get your minds ready for action. We're not talking about living here. We're talking about thinking here. And I know that's true because the second command here is keep sober in spirit. I, now, I know you Baptists. You're saying, I to, that, see, I told you you can't drink. This has nothing to do with drinking. This is metaphorical for sober judgment, level-headed thinking. We're so locked in our traditions, we will bend every and any text to fit what we've always heard without thinking about it. Get ready to think. Get ready to be level-headed in the way you approach life, the way you approach truth. Look at the third one. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, this word hope, uh, English... English hope is not the right definition. And here's the problem of English speakers reading the Bible without doing any study. Uh, I've said it to you before. I hope, I hope this is penetrating enough for you to think about it. The New Testament authors, except for Luke, influenced by Paul, are Hebrew thinkers writing in street Greek. Hebrew thinkers writing in street Greek. Now, they're Hebrew thinkers who have been influenced by the Greek translation, the Septuagint. So the way you define words, how does the Septuagint use those words? Not what some Greek dictionary says or what some Greek poet or some Greek religious thought. No, 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 no. That's not the origin of these words. It's the Septuagint. The word hope does not mean, oh, I wish, I long for, maybe could be possibly, oh, if only, no. This word hope is used primarily by Paul at least, and I think Peter's following Paul, for, a, for the consummation of the believer's faith. Uh, maybe we could say the second coming, and that's what it's talking about here. It's not that we wish Jesus would come back. Oh, that no. Jesus is coming back. Amen? There is more New Testament evidence for the return of Jesus Christ than any other doctrine in the New Testament. Now, the reason it has a hope kind of a understanding is we don't know when and how. Now, several years ago, I was struggling with the second coming. Oh, man. And it finally dawned on me. I don't really care about the second coming. I better explain myself, hadn't I? <laughs> Can I affect when the Lord comes back? No. Do Christians agree on how and when and where the Lord's coming back? No. Should I get so caught up in how the Lord's coming back that I don't witness to the guy that I just met on the street at the restaurant? Am I so caught up in the, a millennial position or an eschatological chart or who I believe and what systematic theology I fall into as far as an eschatology? I'm ready to meet Jesus right now. Tear the roof off, come back Jesus. Life is not easy when you serve him every day. When I see him, my duty's over. <laughs> I, get, I get to lay it down. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, amen? Come tonight, that's great. Come in 20 years, that's great. But until I see you, I'll keep doing what you called me to do. The second coming is a wonderful, true, absolute certainty, but the more you live for him every day, it doesn't matter when or how and all those details we fight over. Ought to be an amen there. It's hard. 
Notice that the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, this, of course, is the way of talking about the second coming here. Would you notice that this is future tense here? To be brought at? Now, I've tried to say this, and um, it is confusing to us as Baptists because we tend to focus on only one aspect of salvation, which is the completed action, aorist tense, past tense. Are you saved is the question we ask. But the Bible presents salvation in all of the Greek verb tenses, and this primarily is a focus on the future, as are most of the Beatitudes, by the way, in Matthew chapter 5. We will not fully be saved until we see him as he is and are changed into his likeness, 1 John 3. We are in the process right now of being saved. We usually use three theological categories to express this truth. We're justified. I'm going back to Romans 8, 29 and 30, if you want to think about it. Justified, we're saved from the penalty of sin. Sanctified, we're saved from the power of sin. Glorified, we're saved from the presence of sin. Justified is the past act. Sanctified is the present reality. And glorification is the future consummation. Jesus is coming again. And the question is, will he find the church faithful and active? The question is not when and how and who and where. The question is, will he find those who claim, and in this text, claim to call him father? Will he find those who claim to call him father doing the things he called them to do? There is the question for the church. I got tickled several years ago. I was a pastor in Lubbock. A guy in Post, Texas took out a full two-page newspaper article on the complete, complete structure of the second coming. He knew when and how and who and where. And I told Peggy, I said, Shazam! <laughs> Jesus doesn't know, and this fool in Post does. That is typical of what we do. We fight over doctrines as an excuse not to live daily, Christ-like, loving, sacrificial lives. We choose up into camps instead of challenging a lost world. Well, notice in verse 14, as obedient children, I wonder if that's sarcastic. <laughs> As obedient children, number four, do not be conformed to the former lust in which, uh, which your, were yours in your ignorance. Now, sounds like a whole lot like a, back to Romans 12 again, doesn't it? Don't let the world mold you into its category. Now, in Greek, this is either a passive imperative or a middle imperative. Unfortunately, in Koine Greek, the form sometimes is exactly the same and the context must determine. Now, this is really important because this struggle is continued through the New Testament. Am I, as a believer, to allow God to conform me? It's passive. I receive. Or am I, as a believer, to make maximum effort to conform myself to what I understand is the will of God? And the answer is, absolutely. As salvation is absolutely free in the finished work of Jesus Christ, but cost everything on the part of the believer and receiver, so the Christian life is absolutely free in the power of God and cost everything in the daily choices of the believer. It is this covenant relationship of a sovereign God dealing with free moral agents made in his image and likeness. And both, both are true. Both are true. Would you say to me today that the church is transforming her society or that the society is transforming the church? <laughs> to say it is to answer it. As a person living in the world today, I see people around me, even those who claim to know Jesus, clinging so hard to the things of this world, desperate for the things of this world, prioritizing the things of this world, her possessions, her titles, her riches, her wealth, 
and yet this world is not our home. Help me sing, would you, this? This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no one like you. Come on, folks. Quit living as if this world is all there is and claiming that this is not the priority of your life. You can tell the priority of your life by your checkbook and your recreation time. Now you tell me what's a priority. <laughs> How much do we need for ourselves? We have been molded and captured by the Western culture of the 18th through 21st century. We are trapped in its thought forms. We are trapped in its priorities. We, we read the Bible through the filter of Western individualism and democracy and capitalism, none of which are biblical. Do not be conformed. Do not be conformed. Do not be molded into the culture around you. Let the truths of the Word of God break through the culture and shine with a power that only comes from the Spirit of God. And it only can happen through the choices you choose to make daily, not some big event in the past. Daily, Christ-like, self-sacrificing choices. Number five is in verse 15. But like the Holy One who called you, of course, this is an emphasis, an emphasis on the sovereign choice and call of God. Somebody said, do you believe in, in, that, that in the sovereignty of God? Well, what else am I going to believe in? Of course there's a sovereign God. And he has called us. And he wants us to be like him. The, so, the Holy One who called you. You can't come to the Father unless the Holy Spirit draws you. Amen? John 6, 44 and 65. We do not choose the day of our salvation. We do not choose the day of our, our reconsecration or recommitment. We do not choose the, 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 the ministry that we go into. We do not choose our personality or our body design. We do not choose these things. We receive these things, and then we give them back to God as a gift of devotion and love. We are owners of nothing and stewards of everything. The Holy One who called you. Now here's number five. Be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Now, of course, what uh, drives me here is um, Matthew 5, 20 and 48. Now, Matthew 5, 48 reflects Leviticus 11. Matthew 5 says, 20 says this. And I think when Jesus said this, every Jew in the crowd quit breathing. Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will no wise enter the kingdom of God. Most conservative, religious people they knew, and Jesus said, it won't cut it. Won't cut it. And then in verse 48, Jesus summarizes that powerful first chapter of the Sermon on the Mount by saying, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Oh, my goodness sakes alive. As I think that Baptist views on salvation have been skewed, I think Baptist theology has ignored the New Testament mandate for holiness. Holiness for us is the name of a charismatic group. Holiness for God is that his children reflect his character. Holiness is not an option, it's a requirement. Holiness is the evidence that we've truly met him and we're in the process of becoming like him. Uh, how, how many uh, verses should I quote? Maybe i just give you one to look up. I'm not going to read it. I want you to look it up. Titus 2.14. We can go to Galatians 4.19. Romans 8, 28 through 30. Uh, Ephesians 1.4. And so many others. We totally ignore in Baptist life. God calls us 
to Christ's likeness. Now, what I've said to you, it is a radical statement. I know it's radical, and I, I make it this way to get your attention. The goal of Christianity is not that you go to heaven when you die. The goal of Christianity is Christ's likeness now. I would describe the gospel as a three-tiered stool. We must personally receive Jesus Christ, welcome him as a friend. We must believe and accept the truths about Jesus Christ from God's word. We must live a life like Jesus Christ because the spirit of Christ indwells us. So it is a person to be welcomed, truths about that person to be believed, and a life like that person to be lived. And too many evangelicals want to take two of those stools' legs legs away. We just want to go back. Well, I, I prayed the prayer. I trusted him. Do you know the Bible? Since you've been saved, have you made it a priority to study God's Word so you'll know who you are and how to live? Number three, has your lifestyle priorities been changing since you met him? Now, if the answer to the last two questions is no, I think there is real doubt that you welcomed the man Jesus Christ. Maybe you accepted what your mother told you or somebody else walked down front and you wanted to take the Lord's Supper too or you joined at camp because your friends were joining. Have you had a personal encounter with the resurrected Jesus Christ? Now, it's by faith, not by sight. And all of us have some degree of doubt. None of us are perfect. None of us live a completely uh, sanctified life. I know that. And I know I'm getting over into one ditch. But it's such a neglected ditch. Maybe if I scream and holler in the ditch of sanctification, it will somehow pull Baptists who only live in the ditch of justification out into the mainstream of New Testament Christianity. The Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior. Not on Sunday, not in your bumper sticker, not in the jewelry you wear, not in how you talk to your Christian friends. In all your behavior, be like God. How do I do that? How did Christ do that? How did the apostles do that? There's the model. There's the model. Now, notice um, verse 16 is a quote from Leviticus. Verse 17, and if first-class conditional assumed to be true for the author's purposes, since you do call God Father, the one who impartially judges according to each man's work. Now, I would say this. Do you remember the verse that says, I've forgotten where it is offhand. Do you remember the verse that says, judgment will begin with the household of God? Now, if God is impartial, Old Testament term, do not lift the face, meaning see who the accused is to affect your judgment. Look at the facts, judge justice on the base of the facts, not the person. Now, if God does that to the church, a church captured by society, a church that reflects the norms of its own age and place, If God doesn't judge America, there's an apology due Sodom and Gomorrah. How long do you think we can get by with having God on our coins and Satan in our hearts? How long can our society drift toward the godless paganism and not pay a price? And the tragedy for me is that you can't tell the difference between the Christian and the non-Christian except where they park their car on Sunday. Now, some of you say, I've heard this before. Well, if you'd get it, I'd quit saying it. You say, you've just picked these verses out. It's almost like the Holy Spirit is drawing me to texts that scream about Christ's likeness. I don't choose the sermons I do. I don't think I do. I don't try to. What is the Spirit of God trying to say to you?
conduct yourselves in fear, knowing that the time of your stay upon the earth. This is the idea of God allness. God fearing God as who he is, the transcendent holy one of Israel. Not taking his name in vain. Not taking his house in vain. Not taking his people in vain. You mean there's a fear and an awesomeness that comes with being a Christian? Oh my, have we lost the fear of God in our day? Fear. Knowing, perfect tense, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from the feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers. Now I wonder who that's talking about. Is he talking to Jews? There were Jews in this church, in these churches. He's not one, he's, t he's writing to, it's a cyclical letter. Could this be a reflection of Isaiah 29, 13? These people worship me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and their worship consists in rote traditions learned from men. Does that describe us? Or is this going back to the pagans who were saved by the grace of God and all of the drunkenness and sexuality and perversion that accompanied first century Greco-Roman society? I don't, I'm not sure who he's talking to, but I guarantee you this, without Christ, it's a feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, amen? But with the precious blood, as of a lamb unblenished and spotless, the blood of Christ. These are Old Testament metaphors for a perfect sacrifice. This is vicarious, substitutionary, Isaiah 13 atonement. He paid a price we couldn't pay. He died an innocent death that we deserve to die. We're only here because of who he is and what he has done. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. Of course, this is preexistent. I hope you'll look at the little phrase, foundation of the world. It's used five times in the New Testament. And every time, I think, it talks about what God did before Genesis 1-1. Five times. Ephesians 1-4 is one of them. Revelation 13-8. Five times. You got a reference Bible. You paid $100 and killed a cow for it. Look it up. But has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. He came and died for you. And through him are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Now here, here is the seventh, the seventh command, verse 22. It skips a paragraph, but it's still in this series. Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls with a sincere love of the brethren, number seven, fervently love one another from the heart. How do I know I'm saved? Do you love one another? This new commandment I give you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, the marker of the redeemed is not a theology, it's not an experience. The marker of the redeemed is fervent love. For one another. They will know that you're my disciples because. Now we're down to a very painful point. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Seven things that God wants to characterize his people. Seven things. And the last one is love. The God of love wants a people of love. Yes, people make us mad. Yes, people hurt our feelings. Yes, people do dumb things. Yes, people make dumb choices. But God wants his people characterized by a people who love one another. Do you love one another? Or do you just come and sit in church together? Do you love one another? Or do you just love those who agree with you, dress like you? Do you love one another? The marker, the marker of a redeemed soul. Fervently love one another from the heart. If there is something disrupting that, I pray you would deal with it as we stand together. Now the Holy Spirit, you've prayed for me, you've told me you did. I pray the Holy Spirit has touched your heart. 
Here are the commands for God, for the holy ones, holy ones. Here is the demand for more than a prayer, isolated from daily lifestyle, Christ-likeness. Here is the charge that holiness is a requirement for every believer. Here is the charge that we must reflect His character and not the world's. Now, friends, I think that is a call from God to the heart of those who are here. And I challenge you to respond in any way that God's Spirit has spoken to your heart. Maybe you want to trust Christ. Maybe you want to join our church. Maybe you want to repent. Maybe you want to seek guidance. Maybe you want to pray for that, that hardness of your own heart. I do not know what God wants to do. But the worst thing to do be leave here and know that God has spoken to your heart and you not respond in the appropriate way. Maybe sing.